Hi, I'm Charlie Strader. I was born in North Carolina, and uh, around the fifth grade, my parents moved to Tampa, Florida. Uh, not too long after that, probably by the time I was eight or nine, my stepfather, who was a refrigeration mechanic, came down to Bonita Springs to put in one of the supermarkets uh, down here. And since it's a long project, he rented a house on the Imperial River. Uh, many of you may even know it. It was Dr. Week's old house. Uh, sit on an Indian mound across from Bonita Bay's marina. Uh, after the job, uh, because my stepfather loved to fish, uh, and being a young boy, I certainly did enjoy being out on the water myself, he, we purchased the property, and uh, later on d uh, during college, I lived there for a little bit, and also permanently moved down in around 79, but we'd been coming here since the late 60s. So got to see some of the changes and got to see Bonita Springs before the big boom of the late 80s and 90s uh, of development. And uh, just was very fortunate to have all those years on the water, in the river, uh, with a background in anthropology and later uh, became president of the Southwest Florida Archaeological Society. Uh, through that, I kind of fell into being involved with the local uh, cultural resources here in Bonita Springs and a uh, uh, wonderful organization called the Bonita Springs Historical Society um, asked me at some point to be president, which I agreed for a few years. And uh, so I've just developed an intense and strong love for our history here uh, in Bonita Springs. Um, it's like anywhere, it's unique and certainly uh, should be appreciated um, because it is something special. If you drive up and down 41 anymore, you'll know it's, you have to look. I just recently came from a trip from uh, around the Gulf from Texas to Florida and it would almost got to be a joke, what state are we in? Well, what's the same chain stores and everything looks the same, but when you drive down old 41, you can see what Florida used to look like. And when we first started coming here, that's how you got to Bonita Springs was the two-lane road. And you would remember Basketville up in uh, Port Charlotte area and driving through uh, Fort Myers didn't take that long. And then a long stretch of Estero, the cattle fields, until you got to Little Bonita Springs and the Everglades Wonder Gardens uh, at the bridge. Um, so I've, I've got to see... Um, both sides of Benita Springs, I think, and uh, I just love it here. I, I My name is Donald True. I've uh, been a resident of Benita Springs for uh, about 76 years, and uh, it's kind of an interesting story how I got here. I was six years old when my parents brought me here from, uh, I was born in Ithaca, New York, and uh, my father, was a, had a farm in Ithaca, and uh, the weathers were real severe. The winters, and my mother, she couldn't cope with the cold weather. So my dad had been to Bonita Springs when his when he was a young boy, and um, he was a uh, cabin boy on one of J.P. Morgan's yachts out of New York City. And um, they sailed into the the Atlantic and down around uh, the tip of Florida, and they went by Miami Beach, and there was no houses or anything on Miami Beach. It was barren, barren country. And they came on into the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, they anchored off of Big Hickory Pass with their yacht, and uh, they got into a dinghy, and they came up the Imperial River and search for fresh water and vegetables and supplies. And uh, they came to Bonita, they came up to Survey uh, in Bonita Springs, was named Survey at that time. And uh, he said it was a wild country. He said everybody carried a gun or, or a knife and uh, for protection. And uh, it was a pretty cool place and he really liked it. And he promised himself that someday he would come back. And, uh, and when he did, 
he uh, sold the farm in uh, Ithaca, New York, and uh, he built a, a covered wagon trailer, and he loaded up a, a lot of our personal belongings, and uh, he bought a touring car and uh, hooked onto that trailer, and uh, several weeks we arrived in Bonita Springs. And uh, that's how I got here. And uh, I was six years old, and my first year in school was in Bonita Springs Mil Mil uh, Elementary School. And uh, we were kind of like foreigners because they didn't, didn't really take to northern people coming to Bonita Springs. And uh, it seems like I had to uh, fight with everybody in every boy in school to became <laughs> so I could be be recognized you know but anyway <laughs> I uh, made it through school there and then I went to high school in uh, Fort Myers graduated from Fort Myers High School and uh, later on I had a short stint of uh, commercial fishing and then and then I had a short stint of uh, commercial Shrimping out in the Gulf of Mexico, off of Key West, and off of Dry Tortugas, and uh, then I had a call from Uncle Sam to send me into the Marine Corps, and so I spent a couple of years in the Marine Corps through Korean War and back home, and uh, I'm uh, really in love with Bonita Springs, and uh, I've traveled all over the United States. I've been in every state except Alaska, and I'm going to go there someday. But uh, living in Bonita Springs has been a, such a, a wonderful place to live. It's uh, everything you need. It's, uh, consequently, we have a lot of good people and uh, good neighbors, and uh, it's just a nice place to call home. <laughs> when you were six. Uh, I started coming here when I was about nine, but I didn't go to school here. Well, what was that like? You hear stories of they'd let you out at recess to go fishing. <laughs> I don't, what was school like besides? Well, the first thing when you, when you enter a, a, a community, a tight-laced tight community like there is here, was back then, mm -hmm. anybody that came in was a foreigner and it was really hard to be accepted. A and foreigner so, as in a Yankee. Yeah. <laughs> okay, gotcha. So you had, to, you had to kind of prove yourself that you were worthy of, of being here, you know? Right, I switched schools a lot growing up too. But So <laughs> would they literally call you a blank Yankee or something? Oh yeah, they, we, were, uh, we were Yankees and uh, of course, they didn't know what a Yankee was. <laughs> <laughs> they just knew you were not from Benita. Yeah, that's right. right, yeah. right, right, and, and right. I learned to fight young. I had to fight, I had to for survival because right. them, them old <laughs> country boys are rough. <laughs> well, you made it through the Marines too, so I'm not going to pick a fight with you. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. My goodness. But uh, you know, Benita Springs was, has been good to me and. Uh, Gave me a a lot of good, uh, would you say, values to live by. You know, you you treated your neighbor right. You did the right thing, and uh, you didn't uh, abuse the the uh, at the country. You know, you well, if you went fishing, you fished. You took what you wanted to eat, and that's the way it was. You know, you didn't catch them just because you could. I think you're, I think, yeah, that to me is wrapped up in, in not just rural, but small town, when everyone knows you. I mean, I know our good friend Byron Lyles likes to tell the story that if he got in trouble in town, his parents knew about it before he got home. In other words, everyone kind of knows everyone, so you, you have to 
so to speak, get along. And, and as you get older and through life here, your word means something to you because you're going to be here next year, year after that, and see that same person eye to eye. So a handshake should mean something. And, sure. And, and yeah. you're, you're, I think that creates morals yeah, uh, think, where, where you're responsible for your own actions and have to face up to them. Well, Don, I, some of my earliest experiences here are jumping off of a rope swing into the Imperial River and swimming around when I was 10, 12 years old and a uh, little boating, a little fishing, that sort of thing before I got to move down here permanently uh, in, the, in the late 70s. Um, what were some of your earliest impressions and memories of the river? <laughs> Well, the, the Imperial River was a, like a, was our playground. All the kids, we, everybody swam in the river when sometimes there'd be 25, 30 kids would meet at the river and everybody would go swimming and have a good time, you know. And uh, one of the, later on, I guess I was probably 12, 14 years old, maybe a little bit older, well, in the railroad, the Atlantic Coast Railroad had a an elevated tower bridge, mm. and uh, it was about I would say forty good forty feet off the water, and uh, we used to climb up there, which we were not supposed to because that was railroad property, you know. Right. But it was they it wasn't in it wasn't in use. It was not uh, operable. And uh, we'd climb up there and get on top of that thing and jump off of it into the river. Well, the river was deeper then than it is now because what's happened to the river now is for the development in the east, they've dug canals and uh, boat slips and all this stuff. And uh, the sand has silted down the river and filled the river up. And so it's really not as deep as it used to be. Mm -hmm. So we were all up there daring each other to jump and uh, this one girl was up there, Wilma Harvard. Oh God. And uh, she said, <laughs> we said, if you'll jump, we will. <laughs> she jumped. <laughs> so you had to, huh? She jumped and then everybody else had to jump. <laughs> oh my goodness. And so we all made it. But anyway, I talked to Wilma a couple of years ago about this, you know. And she said, you know, I don't think I jumped. I think somebody pushed me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. So we used to all swim there. Is and this a confession of yours? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I, did, I don't think I touched her. But anyway, there was a. Right by the railroad bridge, there was a, a dock, and it was a railroad dock, mm -hmm. and the, it was a place where the boats tied up to take freight off of the freight train, and on a cart they bring the freight down to the dock and then load it onto boats. At the, so was, it, it, was that where River Park is now, or on yeah, the other side yeah. where River right, Park right is? Beside the, right beside the railroad bridge. By the bridge itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that bridge has uh, caused some problems too. Back in 1950, I guess it was that uh, we had a hurricane and a lot of heavy rain and water, and uh, a lot of uh, logs and trees were coming down the river, and uh, they floated up against this bridge, and uh, it caused the town to flood. Mm -hmm. Hell, the, there was water in Benita on the main highway, I guess there's probably two feet of water. It was up pretty high. And uh, so the town people got really concerned about this railroad bridge blocking the water, you know. Mm -hmm. So they threatened to, they said, well, they sent the railroad word, if you don't open this, raise this bridge, we're going to blow it up. Mm -hmm. Well, the railroad company came and raised the tracks up. I know the, uh Benson's grocery store flooded, the Lyles Hotel flooded, I think even the old Rehard store was here at that time, downtown, Lawhon store, excuse me, 
Lawhon store got flooded. Was that the most water you've seen flooded no, there? That's probably the most I've seen, but uh, I don't recall uh, water being in Benson's store. No, no, it was uh, before my time. That was the one in '36, I believe. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. Of. We went one time. We were talking about that Thomas store or Thomas Farms. Thomasville. Thomasville. The community. Th there was an old barn out there that was abandoned and. We went out there and got some uh, sheets of roofing tin, mm -hmm. and uh, we made canoes. Uh. We take take a sheet of that tin and roll it over, and then put a spacer in it, uh -huh. and uh, beat the, put a two before a log in the, in the end of it, and beat uh -huh. it shut, and and uh, nail it together, and you had a and, canoe, and uh, do the same thing the other end, and then we used to. Uh, Seems like there was roof and tar used to fall off of the railroad tracks, mm -hmm. off of the trains, mm -hmm. and we'd get that tar and plug the holes in the roof and tin because it was been nailed on, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we made canoes and uh, we would uh -huh. play in the river in those canoes, you know. Wow. And uh, yeah, well, so it was your main recreation for for no, all the there kids. No, there was no there was no You made your own, right. yeah. And uh, but the river was deeper then than it is now, mm -hmm. because of the development. Like I mentioned before, the development they dug all those canals east of town, and the sand comes down. And actually, there's people that had boat docks now; they can't even get a boat up there to it because the sand has silted in and kept them from using uh, it. You know, so the mm -hmm. the uh, the development has really played a job on the river. Uh, you, yes, you're absolutely right. I, I had the good fortune of living in two sections of the river. One downriver where it was nice and wide, uh, kind of across from Bonita Bay's marina where that is now. Where was it? Dr. Weeks' old house on the oh, river yeah, where the yeah. Indian Mound is, that little higher land there. Yeah. And. Um, you know, you can remember things like when the jack came in in the winter, the jackfish, you know, when they start that boil, when they're feeding, it was actually not just as wide as the whole river. It would be two or three times longer. And, you know, and then a few years later, it's smaller, and a few years later, it's smaller, and on down. And, and, and I did notice the, the channels filling up a little with silt there. Where I really noticed it is later on in the um, around 90, late 80s, when I moved up further up the river at the headwaters up here in the DRGR, that these little tributaries um, were white sandy bottoms. And I'm sure you remember going up parts of the Imperial River you look down, it's not black, it's, it's dark water, but it's a white sand because you had a flow, you had a flush and keep that. And, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that in my short time that I've, uh, you know, seen these changes. So I can't imagine. Uh, you know, down the river, you're talking about Doc Weeks' old house, you know. Down there, just a little further, is the is the Orga Hole, where it dep empties into uh, the lower end of Estero Bay. Well, that was the only cut that went into the river. Then, a few years later, they cut into uh, Fish Trap Bay. Correct. And they call that government cut. Right. And uh, that in that allows more water to come out of the river mm -hmm. and get into the bays, because then it goes into the Fish Trap. And then goes Fish Trap Creek out into into uh, well, the lower end of Estero Bay. Well, while while we're talking, I, you know, you hear different stories about the Auger Hole and while it was named, but I think we should take advantage of telling some big fishing lies while while we have a chance at the, while we're talking <laughs> about water. I remember being just up from the Auger Hole, and there's so many oyster bars in there, as you know. Um, and, you know, casting for snook with a, a mirror lure one time. And often common when you're fishing with your lure, you're really paying attention where you cast it in the first few pulls because you often get that strike right at the beginning. And then as you get, you know, you realize, oh, I'm getting nothing. So I'm reeling it in. I'm really, and then once it gets close to the boat, I'm not paying much attention to it. You know, you're daydreaming. 
and about three foot from my john boat, so you're setting down, it's like in a canoe, you know, you're setting right in the water, so to speak. Boom! This nook came out of the water. Probably the biggest I've ever hooked in, in the river itself. <laughs> I don't know, maybe at least 20, but you know, when they're that close to you, they look so big. And uh, I didn't know what to do, but uh, he threw the hook and went his way. And <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what's the biggest uh, you caught in the auger hole or in the river here? What did you used to fish for? And Tell me a fishing story. I have, I've caught mostly what I caught in there were sheephead. I never caught any big fish, big fish in there. Uh, mm -hmm. We used to go down to the pass to go snook fishing. You know, mm -hmm. we never did much snook fishing. Hickory in there. pass. Yeah. Hickory. Yeah. yeah. Now was Little Hickory Pass open when yeah you were here? Yeah, Little Hickory Pass was open, and uh, it was. Uh, Open, but not open. All right. Because in the high tides, there would be probably two or three feet across of water in it. But when the tide went out and dead low tide, All right, you could drive your model layer right across it. Now, where was it exactly? It was when I you, think I know where it is, but you leave uh, Hell's Gate, which uh -huh. is the pass on the south end of of uh, Little Hickory Bay. Mm -hmm. And when you leave Hell's Gate, you go right straight ahead, and it was right due so west. So if you drove, if you went down Bonita Beach Road, to, and the road goes to the right to go north up Hickory Island, if you go left, it goes towards Barefoot Beach. And, yep. and I remember one time I took my Jeep down that point, Bonita Beach, down to uh, north end of Wiggins Pass. I don't remember any major cuts at that time in the... Uh, it, it probably was closed up. Closed. So how far would I have to drive down? I, from what you're describing, it's probably, probably a, a mile. Half, a mile, probably, about yeah, a mile. Yeah, about a mile. Because that's about two and almost three miles down to Wiggins. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But uh, this man, uh, there was an article in a paper the other day about Walter Mack. Yeah, and from the from the uh, Shangri La, I think it was yeah. called something else yeah, at he the owned time. Walter, he owned it. He owned it. He and also owned the South End from Wiggins from a Bonita Beach Road, all the way to Wiggins. Well, he was from the Cadillac family too. He owned if I remember that. right. So and he contracted a, or hired a bunch of men, and they went in there on the bay side mm -hmm. and they cut all those big black mangrove trees down and cut them up and they had a dredge in Little Hickory Bay and they were filling that island up. They were mm -hmm. developing it. Well there are some canals in there. And he got stopped. Okay. Because and that was Walter Mack and there's still some uh, evidence down there of his dredging because there's some pipes in there and. Yeah. And he did that. That was Walter Max. He and he so he he closed off Little Hickory Pass. Could it doesn't take take much to change the flow? He of the cl water, he closed right, it right. off. He he had a piling across there and everything. And yeah, uh, just south of the whatever bay they call it, south of Fish Trap Bay on the south side of Bonita Beach. There, if you go back in through there towards the gulf, you can see some canals that were dug in there as well. On Just the think. north side of Beach Road? The south side of Benita Beach Road. Yeah, that was Walter Mack. He was responsible for a lot of that. Yeah. What were the, the roads like here? I mean, I barely remember, you know, when we first started coming to Benita Springs, there was no new 41. Of course, there was no interstate, so everything was old 41, all the way from Tampa straight to here. Um, the beach road was already in. You could drive to Bonita Beach. What are your earliest remembers, uh, memories of the roads here? Well, the road from uh, Fort Myers to Bonita Springs was paved all the way, but it was, the macadam was like, when the sun shined on it, it would get kind of soft, you know. <laughs> but anyway, the... Uh, 
There were a lot of places between the uh, Ten Mile Canal and Bonita that would be, in the summertime, would be underwater, and you'd have to, the, the uh, road department would come and they would drive stakes along the shoulders of the road so that the cars could know where the road was because the water, rainwater was discolored, you know, and you couldn't see the pavement. Which so is you dark could, anyway, right? And, yeah, dark water, so you just drive in the, in the water. And so you, when you say Ten Mile Canal, canal you're, you're speaking of area kind of just south of Page Field. I'm talking about the road, I mean the area just north of uh, Alico, where Alico comes out, yeah. Right. And, uh, but uh, south of there, so in the summertime, we went to Fort Myers for shopping. We rode the Greyhound bus because the bus had no problem getting mm -hmm. through the water. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, we would ride the bus to Fort Myers, go to the movies or whatever, and then we'd take the bus back home because and that w that was underwater but the beach road was uh parts of it was sh was paved and part of it wasn't and uh the bridge that goes over to uh Hickory Island now was low it was when the tide was high and you go to that bridge you, the water would splash up between the between wow. cracks in the bridge, and that's how the how low that bridge was, you know. Wow. And uh, but uh, the roads were and in Benita, the first streets that were ever paved was Dean Street. Okay. That was the only. That was the first paved road. Mm -hmm. Was Dean Street. The rest of them were all uh, shell roads, beach shells, mm -hmm. and uh, which was detrimental to cars because there's a lot of conks in the road and the, <laughs> you run over one of those conks and it would flip right. up and puncture your tires you know but the, that was the and then 41 was paved all the way through you know right I, I understand some of the earliest roads like you're talking about in Benito uh, when you go towards the Gulf uh, there were a lot of large shell mounds left by the Clusa Indians that that's what they would use. They would dredge the shell and bring it up into town to help make a road yeah. base. Yeah, so, the, uh, uh, the biggest shell mounds were uh, south of Bonita Beach Road over in uh, what it, which is now uh, Bonita Shores around the right. bay. There's still some pretty good sized mounds in there but uh, mm -hmm. they don't dig them anymore, you know. My father-in-law was born in Bonita, uh, met McSwain, and he's my stepfather, rather, and uh, he worked on a road crew, and uh, they hauled that beach shell out of there with the uh, mules and wagons, mm -hmm. and they dumped it on the roads going towards Fort Myers, and they mm -hmm had a section of that road that they built with beach shell out of the Indian mounds, which they were not graves, they were, you know, garbage garbage pits for the Middens, Indians. Right, yeah, right, yeah. midden shell. So right, that's right. how they, they built the part of uh, old 41, you By know. mule, though, not Yeah, not mules by and wagon. Truck. Yeah, no trucks. So you're glad you're not that old to have to do <laughs> that work on that, aren't you? <laughs> but later on in years, uh, my dad, he, he worked for the county. This was uh, right about the time of the WPA. And uh, he drove a truck for the, and they hauled that shell, and they still put some of that shell on the streets. Mm -hmm. Back then, they didn't have, they didn't pave them. They mm -hmm. just put shell on them, you know, to deal with the sand like everybody knows. This whole area was a beach at one time. Sugar sand, we used to call it. <laughs> yeah. Sugar, oh, you, yeah. You could get stuck real <laughs> fast in sugar sand. Yeah. So, when, say when you were younger, Bonita Springs, survey Bonita Springs, is what, five miles or so from the actual beach. So, when you were young, if you wanted to go to the beach, you had to find some with a car, or did you bicycle to it, or were there buses? How did you... you Go to the beach. 
we used to drive by, ride our bikes down there, and uh, I used to. At one time, my parents had a house when I was real little down on uh, near Stanton subdivision on the river. Right. And we had to. We rode our bicycles all from there, you know. And That's pretty to, closer. Just yeah. to jump it right. down to the beach, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. So all the bridges were in. You could get to the yeah. beach easy. Oh, yeah. Just some yeah. of the bridges were yeah. lower. It certainly made a change. Was that what was the the bigger change? Obviously, um, I don't know. It's hard to say which was bigger. You had all as far as changes when New Forty One came in. It radically changed what we knew as a downtown Bonita Springs, Old Forty One, or the Tamiami Trail. The businesses, the shopping centers grew up at the Beach Road, uh, Sunshine Plaza, and uh, what was it, Hartley's, and some of the others. It's harder to measure the impact of I-75 come in, but in some yeah, ways it, I think it's just as strong. It just brought more people to our I community. don't think I-75 brought more people. Okay. I think it just allowed people to get to Miami from Tampa quicker. Right. I don't okay. think that it had anything to do with uh, Benita Springs growing because it didn't okay. didn't bring people in. It, it just facilitated the growth period of, of the 90s, I guess. Charlie, the biggest thing that facilitated growth here was the Second World War. I thought you were going to say air conditioning, but go ahead. The Second World War, we had military bases all the way around us. Mm -hmm. In Naples, they had crash Army Crash Boat Service, Air Force. Right. Fort Myers Beach, they had the Coast Guard. Fort Myers, they had the Air Force, Army Air Force. Buckingham mm -hmm. was uh, the largest flexible gunnery school in the world. Wow in Buckingham where they trained the gunners from sh uh, shooting targets off, towed by another plane out over the Gulf of Mexico. The sky was full of... What about Page Field? What were the, Page what was Field was an Air Force, an Army Air Force Army field Air Force. and um, we, uh, we were influxed with a lot of military men mm -hmm. When they were off duty or on the weekends, they would go out to have fun, and they came to Bonita Springs because there was a lot of, a lot of the young girls here and a lot of open bars, and uh, it's a good place to go to the beach. And so we had a lot of military people, and that's when they found out about this place. Mm -hmm. When the war was over in '45, and the people and the guys went back home, they told their parents, parents came mm -hmm. and that's when we got I think that was the biggest thing and the next thing people say well city water well that helped that was yeah, another thing it did it but did. Uh, I really think that uh, the uh, well I've, I've thought about that quite often in the sense that during the the World War II training period etc that you do hear a lot that the, the people, military men would come specifically to Bonita Beach and Bonita Springs, but it's probably quicker for them to go to Fort Myers Beach. So there, like you said, there had to be some other factors. It, it wasn't just the shortest way to the beach. They had wanted to come here for particular reasons. So, uh, Well, it was, you get right down to the, the bottom line, Bonita Springs was a, small sensitive environmental place where you could go fishing you could go hunting you could you could your freedom to do about anything you wanted to do without any intrusion of anybody go picnic on the beach have a bonfire on the beach right anytime you wanted yeah right. i miss those days sure when my kids were growing up we in the summertime, there was no houses or no restrictions or anything on the south end of Bonita Beach Road, of the Bonita of uh, Little Hickory Island, mm -hmm. and uh, 
we would go down there with uh, our camping trailers and our tents and uh, we'd set up camp and we'd stay down there for three weeks and just live on the beach and uh, the people that had jobs went to work from there yeah. the ladies took care of the kids we had a, we cooked like community cooking we had a big big pot we cook all our food in and Get. What time of year was this? In the no. summertime. Sum summer. Yeah. And we would, st and the kids would just run wild. I mean, they were a good time, you know? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Do you remember seeing many of the fiddler crabs back then? Oh, yeah. Lots of, well, hordes of them. Thousands just, of them. Just as big as areas as of this house. Just swarm. It was yeah. amazing to see yeah. just a wash of color, all the orange in there when the sun was What's happened to those, I think, is development is uh, taken over the country where they were, the, you know. Habitat yeah. loss, yeah. I guess. Right. Yeah. Right. So things have changed considerable. I mean, for me, it's like the old saying, the old timers say, well, they ruined us. <laughs> They ruined the place. <laughs> well, the, the overriding factors we still have. We still have good weather in the winter, and we still have a beach. We still have water. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's reasons to still live in Bahia Springs, but I miss a lot of uh, the way it was uh, uh, as well, obviously. Well, I, like I said earlier in one of the interviews that... Uh, I've been all over the United States, every state in the Union. I've been to foreign countries, and this is the best place to live. Even with the, even with all the city's restrictions and all their crap, boy, it's still a better, better place to live. I'll have to agree with you. I've I've been fortunate to travel some myself. Uh, I do international travel, you know, as you know, for my business, and love love going to see other countries, love the visit, but this is home in the sense of a great place to live. It's just, we're so fortunate to be here. We really are. You know, you go from, like in the wintertime, you got a little cold weather here. Mm -hmm. You go north, and you go to Fort Myers, and it's cold. <laughs> and that's, a, it is. Now, it's now. Temperatures. Colder in Fort I thought Myers. the line was around Sarasota, generally. <laughs> but, it, but it's colder. North of Sarasota. Colder in Fort Myers than it is here. And if you go east, mm -hmm. you go to Immokalee, they get cold over there. Yeah. So we're in a good spot. I, I couldn't agree more, and that's one of the reasons. I joke with people, I'd move somewhere else if there was somewhere else to go. There's really not much further south than us here on no, this I don't, coast. No, I don't want to go. I don't want to live in Miami or the Keys. So if you would like to live in warm weather, this is pretty much it. You see, when, when I went to school in Bonita Springs, on the, there was no air conditioning. Uh, lunches, lunchroom was a place, a bunch of wooden benches and tables. You brought your own brown bag, and uh, they served water. <laughs> they served water. <laughs> and no you, screen. You didn't have the little milk cartons <laughs> from uh, McCormick Dairy, or? They did at one time. They had uh, little bottles of milk come from uh, McCormick's, McCormick's Dairy, mm -hmm. and uh, but you had to had to buy that, and if you didn't have any money, you went without. You know. It wasn't furnished by the school. You had to have money to to buy that, and uh, the flies and the mosquitoes would come into the no screens on the windows, and uh, that was your air conditioning. No fans. No fans. <laughs> so paradise was different. <laughs> it was definitely different. Yeah. I tell I tell this story about going to going to school there, and uh, McCormick's had a 
Morris McCormick had a dairy out on the end of Dean Not Street. Not Morris, but his, his uh -huh. fa Morris's family. Yeah. Right. This was his name. Oh. Morris McCormick. Not senior. The senior. Okay. Oh, he was a grandpa. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and uh, his the cow. See, back then we had open range in uh, Florida, and if you had a a home site, you fenced your home site in right. because you had to keep the animals out, right? The horses and the cows and. Whatever. The school had a barbed wire fence around yeah, it too. That's to keep the right. animals out. Right. So these uh, cows used to come from the dairy down there around the school, and so at recess time we'd go out there and catch those cows and ride them like, yippee, here we go, you know. Uh, and we'd we'd catch a young heifer, or a little young cow, you know. We'd, oh, you wouldn't do it with the big ones. No. No. We, we, and we'd ride those cows, and uh, <laughs> I guess. I can remember this one kid was riding one, and then the cow just run underneath a grapefruit tree and just brushed him right off. <laughs> so we used to have a lot of fun with the cows, you know. <laughs> I, to, to this day, my, my favorite story, true or not, who knows on quotes, right? But I guess it was Mrs. McCormick who owned the, the dairy you're talking about that supplied milk to the school kids. S at some point in time, the U.S. government came to her and said, you can't supply that milk to these children. It's not pasteurized. And she was very indignant and said, well, of course they're pasteurized. They were in the pasture all day long. <laughs> so true or not, I just I always loved that story. Uh, who knows? Um, yeah. Uh, Donald, I understand you were a guide at the Everglades Wonder Garden. Yes, I was. Uh, I was... Uh grew up in my younger years at the at the Wonder Gardens and wow. this kind of grew into it and but my brother Alfred was he was the uh, first guide they ever had wow. and he was a, he was uh, going to uh, Fort Myers High School at the time and of course I was four years younger than he was mm -hmm. and so I had uh, the duty sometime of guiding people around the park and tell them about the wildlife and their habits and all that stuff. Yes, I was, I was. So a, you helped feed the animals, you helped did whatever had to be did done, everything. build the cages. Yeah, I did everything and right, right, uh, right. I was just part of the early uh, formation of the thing because I was there when it was happening. So you said you used to travel around the state with, with Bill on various wildlife. What, oh, what yeah. was typical that you would go do? Um, we would uh, go to old uh, abandoned farms or buildings and look for snakes, look for uh, rat snakes, or we might go out at night in, uh, with headlights and uh, catch cottonmouth moccasins and water snakes and uh, we might be have to go out and uh, uh, spear some garfish and stuff to bring it back to feed the animals and feed the reptiles. Yeah. Well, uh, well yeah, I knew it started as the Benin Springs Reptile Gardens. Yeah. That, were you there when he started to bring in like panthers and the bears? Yep. Yeah, as panthers well? and bears and yeah, we uh, uh, we had those uh, three baby bears came in, and they were uh, the story goes, you know, they were called Tom, Dick, and Harry, and uh, there were three little bears, and they were real, like three of them were in an almost a box the size of a shoebox. Wow! And they were just little cubs, you know, and I found out that Harry was a girl, so he became Harriet. Harriet. So, you know, there's some, and then we had baby deer, we, we nursed, we had uh, people would, hunters would bring in uh, baby deer. We'd you, you said your, your brother Alfred used to swim with one, take one of the bears out to go swimming in the river there. Yeah, we had Is a, that something you never decided to, to join them when they would do that, or? <laughs> he, he just wanted to do it, I guess, and uh, this big bear her name was Susie 
and uh, had a collar on her, and he had a dog chain, and so he would take her down to the river and go swimming with her, and uh, she just, the bear just loved it, you know, mm. and that was the fun part, but trying to get her out of the river, that was a problem too, yeah. and sometimes he'd have to get a pan of food or some fruit or something right. to coax her back into her cage because she was pretty stubborn. She wouldn't weigh about 250 pounds, you know, yeah. big bear. <laughs> right. So were, so they were, how did he acquire his panthers? And I mean, that, you know, unloading a, uh, a, certainly a bear or a panther out of your cage. I've heard a few stories around town of people handling that. That uh, well, must have been exciting. The Panthers uh, were brought in, most of them were brought in to start with for just kittens, you know, mm. and uh, raised there. Okay. And uh, then if they were transported, they would have been big box cages, you know. Mm -hmm. You'd take a big box and put it up to the door of the cage and shoot them in there. And were, were you involved in when they would take the animals out to the schools? Uh, yes, well? I was. We used to take. Uh -huh. Uh, I used to go with Bill Falker at night and uh, in the evenings, and we would go to uh, Fort Myers or Naples or Arcadia, and uh, he would uh, we would take rattlesnakes and other wildlife and mm. and uh, on exhibit, you know. And I used to go with him for that. Yeah, I can't imagine. I understand that Bill and Bill or one of them played musical instruments and such. Well, Bill Piper played a played a guitar. He was a quite a guitarist. He was real good at it. Yeah. And uh, I thought he lost he lost a thumb too, and he had to give it up. He lost a thumb or? to an alligator, but yeah, that yeah. didn't stop him. Okay, good. But uh, the the uh, the reptile gardens you had the general public coming in there, and you'd have all classes of people and uh, this one bunch of guys came in there and uh, they were drinking and well I don't know how drunk they were and uh, we always had a, uh, a hook stick by the pen there for the to pull the plugs on and to fish out any trash that got thrown in there you know mm -hmm. and this this drunk was in there and he uh, was uh, that pole, and he was poking the alligators. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lester come by, and he says, hey, don't do that, and walked off. And the guy went back, and he was doing it again. And it really made Lester mad. And he went, and he grabbed that guy and had him up over his shoulder, and he was going to throw him in that alligator pen. Mm. And Bill come along, and he, I can hear it now yelling, don't no, do it. no, <laughs> don't do that. You know, <laughs> Lester put him down. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, it was that time I realized how strong Lester Piper was. He was a much of a man, I tell you. He uh, was a hero. And they got to live pretty long lives, too. Yes, both they did. Of them yeah. did. Um, yeah. uh, now, which one got into cattle? Bill. Bill, and Bill he moved down to Mockley Road down yeah. here. Yeah, he bought area. He, he got into real estate and mm -hmm. bought land. He see Bill Piper at one time owned Palm River. Mm -hmm. He owned Palm River, and he he run cattle on it. He owned twenty three sections of land. The family did. Together. Yeah, but that wasn't part of it. Oh, okay. And then he. Uh, he sold sold that, and then he bought out on the Mockley Road at the uh, Mule Pens, mm. and he bought land out there. And he that was I don't know how many sections there, but uh, they owned that together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Donald, as always, it's a pleasure chatting with you. <laughs> Good well, to see been, you again. It's been fun. Uh, enjoyed swapping some lies with you and uh, hopefully we got a few little truths in there here and there. <laughs> so. Yeah, well you know all all uh, uh stories have to have a little 
humor into them, you know. Yeah, well, you're the man to talk to. I think you know where all the bodies are buried here in Bonita, <laughs> so I always appreciate it. So goodbye. Thank you for listening to some stories about early Bonita Springs and our history here.